Good evening and welcome to the 2020 Portland at Large Candidate Debate. I am Tim Wells and I'll be the moderator for, Tim, for tonight's debate. There are four candidates running for the seat previously occupied by the much like Jill Dusen, who held this seat for almost two decades. Justin Costa, Costa, April Fournier, Ron Gann, and Laura Kelly are the four candidates. The 37-year-old Justin Costa grew up in Brunswick and earned a BA from Wesleyan University and a law degree from the University of Southern Maine. In 2008, Justin was elected to the Portland School Board, where he served two terms, including as chair of the Finance Committee. In 2014, he was elected to represent District 4 as their city councilor, and in 2017, he was re-elected with 68% of the vote to his second term. He lives in Deering Center with his wife, Zoe. The 40-year-old April Fournier is the mother of four children with her husband, Kevin, ages 12 through 19. She describes herself as a strong, resilient, indigenous woman. April feels that her life experiences and education have created opportunities that help her understand issues from many different perspectives. April holds a master's degree in education and currently serves as a special services manager at the local Head Start agency. One of April's favorite hobbies is roller derby. The 70-year-old Ron Gann is the father of two adult children, ages 31 and 38. He has been involved in the construction and real estate businesses since 1972. He started working for his family's elevator and repair business and ultimately started his own construction and development company focused on both residential and commercial projects. Hailing from Chicago, Ron visited Portland in 2002 and says that he was hit by a blast of salt air and he instantly fell in love with the city. In 2007, he and his partner started their first project in Portland, the townhomes on Federal Street. In Chicago, Ron was a central player in the redevelopment of Chicago's Bucktown neighborhood that had a growing gang and drug problem. Ron has appeared before the planning board and city council numerous times in regard to land use issues. Ron is an avid hockey player, musician, and has appeared on Home Again with Bob Vila. The 48-year-old Laura Kelly and her husband Michael have three children, ages 15 through 22. She is a retired pediatrician and played a role in protecting public safety with the work with the Maine Families for Vaccines Coalition. She is a long-term Portland resident and a graduate of Deering High School, Smith College, and UNE College of Osteopathic Medicine. The questions for tonight's debate were formulated by a five-person panel. The members of the panel included Chris Busby of, Maine, of the Mainer, Randy Billings of the Portland Press Herald, Nick Schroeder of the Bangor Daily News, Wendy Cherubini of USM, and myself. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so the answer times have been kept to a fairly tight timeline. We hope this is a substantive debate and is a valuable piece to our watchers in helping them understand these candidates and the issues facing Portland. The order of answering will rotate so that each candidate will have equal opportunity to be in first, second, third, or last position. At the end of the debate, each candidate will have two minutes for closing statements. The answer times will be stated at the end of each question. So let's get started. <clears throat> the first category of questions is the role of the city councilor. And Justin Costa, you will start off answering first. What personal and professional experiences and education makes you feel you are prepared for the role of city councilor? And how will that make you more effective than the other candidates at crafting and deciding upon policy? You have 60 seconds. Uh, thanks, Tim, and uh, thanks to everyone that's had a hand in putting this event together tonight. Uh, this is a real public service, I think. Um, you know, obviously, I'm on the council right now. I'm completing my sixth year there uh, with Jill leaving. I'm going to be the uh, second most experienced person. And before that, I was able to spend uh, six years on the school board as well, um, including time, as you mentioned, uh, chairing the finance committee, uh, which was during the uh, economic recession uh, roughly a decade ago. Um, so my background and experience is directly relevant to this. I have served on nearly every subcommittee of the school board and the city council. So I, uh, I think, credibly have a claim to know as much about municipal government, how it operates, what the role of a counselor is, uh, as compared to staff or a school board member uh, as anyone that's running. And I think in these challenging times, that's going to be incredibly important. Thank you very much, Councillor Costa. April Fournier. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks so much for having us. I think this is a great question. Um, I think my experience uh, living in Portland is I, you know, we bought a house here in 2006 when we only had two kids and very suddenly ended up with four. <laughs> so we went from a very small family to a very large family. So we've navigated having children go through Portland public schools. I've served on PTOs and coach little league teams and served on boards for um, athletics as well as work in education myself. And so worked actually for child development services for five years serving families um, in Portland uh, as they navigated the difficult task of having their children identified as a child with a disability uh, and engaging with community resources. So I think all of this as a counselor, it's so critical that you can communicate, that you can listen, that you know how to bring in resources and how to make decisions. And I very clearly know how to do that. Thank you very much, April. Ron? Had to, un had to unmute. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, I have been involved with quite a number of different groups um, over the years. I, when I lived in Chicago, um, I was part of my kids' school. I was on both the finance committee, the building committee, the raise the money committee. Um, I was at every parent meeting for 17 years. Um, in the world of construction and development, I have had to interface and collaborate with dozens and dozens of people over many different uh, situations and conditions. Uh, you're in the business of problem solving every single day. But one of the things I want to say, though, is that I think that we have to think about new roles for counselors not the old roles for counselors. And I think that while there are some people who are experienced in governmental affairs and the mechanics of the council, we need to have people who are more connected to the street and can really relate. Thank to you very them. much, Ron. Thank you. Laura. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, build on what Ron said a little bit, which is that uh, experience matters only when it has made a difference. Um, I think that, you know, everybody here has a relevant experience that could be valuable uh, to Portland at this moment. Um, we are in a, a global pandemic and uh, I'm a physician. So certainly um, I bring a, an important perspective on public health and well-being. Uh, in fact, um, I actually believe that if we used health and well-being as our direction in all policy making, that we would manifest better outcomes. Um, I think uh, in, in my experience, um, uh, working with Maine Families for Vaccines uh, in, in the legislature, uh, I, I observed um, how, how important it was to sort of um, make sure that we're using evidence-based um, solutions to solve problems. And um, that's what I do best. So that, that's what I have to offer. And thank you. Thank you. For the second question, April, you'll be starting off. How do you see the council's relationship with the city manager position? Do you favor a more aggressive oversight of the city manager or is the current relationship balanced properly? Well, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, so I, the way that I see the council's relationship with the city manager is I really feel like I've heard in multiple meetings that the city manager has said, well, I really work for you, I report to you, but it definitely feels like there's an imbalance of power, power there. Um, what I think it should be more like is that the city manager and the city staff, they're the operations, they carry out what um, we're making for policy decisions on the city council side. The city council side is really that constituent services, really listening to community members, hearing the things that they're frustrated with, hearing the things that they're happy about. And then that helps to influence the policies that should then be carried out by the city staff. So I think it's right now in my mind, a little bit of a dysfunctional relationship where there's maybe a little more power on one side and not the other. And I'd like to see that balanced out. Wonderful, thank you. Ron, 60 seconds. Um, I would like to say that the relationship between the mayor and the, uh, between the city council and the uh, city manager 
needs to be more aggressive. I think the city council needs to take a much bigger role in making sure that the city manager is doing his or her job. From my point of view, the city manager is in charge of counting the money and making sure that the people who are below that person are operating at the highest level. I think the city council has abdicated a lot of that responsibility and has not been paying attention to what is going on uh, downstream. I think that uh, we should have a mayor who has vision and agendas and should be able to be able to do that without having to go hat in hand to the city manager. Thank you very much, Ron. Laura? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I, I have said before that uh, in, in conversations with people, the city manager is a polarizing figure in Portland. And there are a lot of opinions on both sides, some that he does a very good job, and some people feel that, that there are things that, that are happening that, that he's controlling and the counselors are not. Um, this is an issue that has been um, opened and considered uh, by the citizenry before. And I think the feeling is that because counselors are elected and they're the ones that choose the city manager, that, that the voice of the people is re reflected in that choice. Um, and so um, ultimately, um, after talking to a lot of people about this, both from city hall and, and from, from outside, um, I think that, that, there's, that, that we could do a better job in, co in communicating and helping people understand what people's roles are and, and seek a bit more balance. Thank you. Councilor Costa. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that this is an interesting question. I, I think uh, that, you know, it's, it's always an overgeneralization when you try to condense multiple people's opinions into one statement. Uh, but I don't think the counselors feel like uh, there's some uh, kind of tension or a lack of clarity in the relationship that we have with the manager. Uh, the council is responsible for setting policy for the city. Uh, the manager is effectively uh, the executive for most, uh, not all, but for most function in the city government. And for the most part, uh, that functions fairly well. Um, I think that there uh, you know, there has been confusion over the last several years, uh, to be direct, because, um, you know, we, we had a mayor that didn't uh, accept the charter-defined uh, responsibilities of, of the role, and I think that certainly caused some confusion. Uh, but I think the council is very clear in our relationship with John that he works for us. We all know that, and he knows that as well. Thank you. For the third question. The voices you are going to hear most at council meetings, district meetings, and through email will be from a small group of activists, many retirees, and paid lobbyists. Many of your constituents do not have the time to participate or keep up with city government. How do you balance this out, and how will you reach out to your constituents who aren't very active and keep a strong pulse over all of those you represent versus just the loudest voices? Ron Gann, you start. Well, I think that is uh, 45 seconds. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that first off, we have to examine what the role of the at-large counselor is. Up till now, I'm not sure what that role has been. I see the role of an at-large counselor as sort of an adjunct mayor. Uh, you represent the, ent the entire city, and we should be doing things for the greater good of the entire city. I've thought about this. I don't know exactly the best way to keep communication going with all the different uh, constituents out there, but I would encourage people to contact us on a regular basis. Even if they're not gonna be able to come to city council meetings, they need to contact us and tell us really what it is that's going on. Thank you very much, Ron. Laura? Thanks. Um... I love this question. Um, I have always felt that uh, paying attention to politics and paying attention to policy is a privilege. Um, most people are busy in their lives uh, and they don't have time. They are working uh, with integrity and passion in, in the things that they do and they're expecting others to do the same. 
It's one of the reasons that has drawn me into participating. And um, the thing is that, um, as you say, the loudest voices uh, get the most attention, but we really need to pay attention to the people who care, but don't have time. And, and, and making that easy and improving communication is, is essential to building community health and well-being. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Costa. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, it, you know, I, I think the way you frame the question sort of has the the biggest uh, part to it. Um, you know, as a counselor, it's our it's our job to hear from people, but it's also to uh, have a sense of what the broader community is like, and uh, to exercise our judgment as the elected representative uh, of all of the people, not just the ones that uh, give us phone calls or emails or show up in council meetings. Um, that's a very difficult thing to do that I think uh, takes time and is one of the things that comes with experience. Um, you get a sense of uh, not just the community as it is, but how a community changes over time. Um, and that's one of the things uh, that I've been able uh, to learn in my uh, 12 years uh, in the school board and uh, city government, and uh, it's a very important part of the role. Thank you very much. April? Thanks. I love this question. Um, I think one of the things that I excel at is inclusion. So when I am in any room, whether it's in a school meeting or a work meeting um, or even a sports meeting, um, I'm looking for what voices aren't there because I can see everyone that's in the room with me and that's great that they showed up. But being the parent who was at home with four kids and couldn't get to city hall to be able to give testimony, being a parent of a child with a disability who couldn't spend an entire day up at Augusta trying to give testimony, I recognize that not everyone has the same privilege to participate as Laura said. So I'm consistently looking for the voices that aren't in the room and that's making connections with community leaders. That's making sure that you're able to get out into the community and bring those voices in. Thank you very much. We are now transitioning <clears throat> to the next uh, category of questions, which is Portland 2050. Is gentrification a problem? And if so, what can and will you do to stop it from happening? You will have 60 seconds. And Laura, you are up first. Uh, <clears throat> so, in Yes, and the answer to that question is, I, I believe that it is. Uh, I, I don't know if it's been quantified, but certainly um, the expense of living in Portland uh, has, um, has changed uh, um, who is able to, to come here and live here and stay here. Um, and you said, what was the second part of the question? If so, what can and will you do to stop it from happening if gentrification is a problem? Um, so one of, one of the ways to uh, prevent something from happening or slow, slow it or stop it from getting worse, again, is, is to understand the reasons that it's happening and, and to try and mitig mitigate those reasons. Um, and so, again, with, without having a specific... Uh, you know, uh, I, idea of, of how, how much is happening. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I've run out of time. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, Justin, you are next. Um, yeah, gentrification is absolutely a problem. Um, I think all of us recognize that. Um, I think it's important also to recognize that gentrification isn't just a Portland problem. Um, it's a problem that's occurring all over the place uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, I, I sort of uh, try to emphasize three different uh, concrete things um, that, you know, obviously I can only skim the surface of right here. Um, but first and foremost, uh, I think we can't gloss over the fact that uh, part of making housing affordable is having uh, a solid economic foundation. And the more uh, quality jobs that you can give to people, the more people uh, have access to housing that they're able to pay for. But uh, putting that aside, uh, the city is very unique in having a municipal housing trust. Uh, we need to continue to look at ways 
that we use that to support the development of new housing. And also, I think, get outside of that and say, are there ways that we can use the housing trust uh, to support um, a variety of other uh, rental supports? And then uh, a whole other topic, of course, is uh, the zoning code, which we are currently in the process of rewriting, which will have a major impact on the development, hopefully, of housing throughout the city. Thank you very much. April? Thank you. Yeah, I would I would definitely echo uh, what's been said. It is absolutely a problem. Uh, I think when we have tried to update our city, you know, for the benefit of tourists, we are now also sacrificing the experience and livability for the residents, uh, which is unfortunate. I think we definitely need to look at how can we look at our zoning and recode to make um, that more inclusionary. Um, we need to be able to enact a minimum wage that is livable so that the people who do live here and work here can stay living here and working here. Um, I think being able to better regulate uh, Airbnbs, uh, as we have already done a little bit, so much more needs to be done. Um, if you are in a neighborhood and I, as I was out flyering, saw a number of people going in and out of buildings that definitely didn't live here and were just staying for the weekend, um, you know, it's hard when you have so many of those, it takes up so much of the housing. So, yep, <laughs> not a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you very much. Uh, Ron? Let me first say that I really do not like that word, gentrification, because after being in my business for 40 years, I've heard a thousand of different definitions, including the one that I was told 30 years ago that the minute somebody mows their front lawn, that's when gentrification starts. So I don't see gentrification, since I don't really know what everyone's definition of it is, I don't see it as a problem. What I see as a problem are the policies that restrict our land use, that make it impossible to create the kind of, the kind of housing that people who are in our workforce can afford. So to jump on, you know, this case of gentrification, that that is the root of our problem, it's not. The root of our problem goes back maybe 15 years and has been uh, consistently the policy of the city council here is to keep land at a minimum so that the price of it is at a premium. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> For the second question, today, Portland's population is 10,000 less than in the 1970s. Growth over the last few years is stagnant, even though the city has added over 2,000 new homes over the last decade. The city's comprehensive plan calls for an increase of 5,000 people over the next 10 years, or 500 people per year. Is this enough, too little, or just right? And Justin, it's back to you as, for, as the first person. And, uh, 30 seconds. Um, yeah, in general, I think that's about right. Um, I think it is important whenever we talk about growth in that, uh, in this way, that we think about it in a regional and statewide context as well. Um, you know, uh, in many ways, Portland is an island in the state of Maine, uh, which is struggling to maintain a population. Uh, and we need to recognize our unique role uh, in the state uh, in terms of uh, the percentage of the economy uh, that we have and uh, also as its biggest population center. But I, I don't think there's much question that we need some level of growth going forward. Thank you. April? Thank you. Um, you know, I, I definitely agree that we need, and that seems like a good rate of growth for population, but I, I always am concerned about adding more when we're already struggling taking care of the people that we have. Um, so I think definitely to Justin's point, looking at growth from a county perspective, from a state perspective, um, and making sure that, you know, we, we have the resources to be able to take care of the people that are here. Um, you know, I think adding, you know, new members to our community is critical Ooh, at a time. <laughs> if you, if you are trying to finish a thought, go ahead and finish that thought. I'll give you another four or five seconds, <clears throat> but just try to wrap it up. So it's not too awkward here. Uh, Ron? Well, I think that um, we are clearly 
not just stagnant, but the current policies that we have here have really choked down creativity. So we need at least 5,000 new residents, 5,000 new housing units. And we can easily accomplish that without uh, creating any adverse conditions on existing land or our neighbor's land. Uh, we have good city land to get this thing going with. And if we don't do that, there's not going to be anybody to take care of me when I get to be 80 years old. Thank you very much. Laura? So, you know, I, I hear a lot from people about um, in, in Portland about being worried about how the city will change and wanting it to stay the same wanting it to be less expensive and more affordable, wanting to have more houses, wanting people to stay, um, and, and all the limits to, to how, it, how it might change. So we want it to get better and, 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 and give more opportunity so that people can stay here. We don't want it to change. And those are competing interests. And I think that, that, what, that we need we need to to find sort of courage and open mindedness uh, to 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 figure out um, how to to build a city. There's there there's space and solutions uh, that will keep us healthy and and um, and support uh, climate change. Like we can do all of these things with a good with good design and innovation. And thank you uh, very much. <laughs> um, the next question. What are five goals the city should set to accomplish over the next 10 years? <clears throat> this is 75 seconds and April, you are first. Thanks, I think this is a great question. Um, I think one of the things that is critical for us to do is, you know, we have the um, climate plan that was just developed between Portland and South Portland. And I think one climate future is great, but we need to make sure that there are really specific timelines, goals, measurements, so that it's not just a, well, we'd like to, or this sounds really good. Um, one of the things I think that we can absolutely accomplish is having a municipal curbside composting program, um, making sure that we are doing a better job at educating our community around recycling, um, not only in English, but using pictures and various languages and going out and educating the community. And then also, you know, we are a tourist destination. We allow these giant cruise ships to come into our harbor. Um, making sure that we're in leveraging some sort of environmental impact fee because they are bringing um, emissions with them. I think making sure that we also have equity and education. The Portland Promise is wonderful. So I think we should continue to partner as a city with um, the school board to uh, enact universal pre-K that comes with transportation. So it is truly accessible for everyone. Um, we are getting ready to go into the Charter Commission. I think we should be able to look at our Police Citizen Review Committee uh, and make it a true citizen oversight board rather than just a rubber stamp at the end of the process. Um, and then we absolutely have to address housing, making sure that our residents are housed and acting more housing first um, developments is critical. Ron, you are up next. Um, first and foremost, I believe it has to be housing that most of our efforts um, in the next two years or so have to be around housing and the generation of revenue. And the best way to generate that revenue is by building a thousand housing units as quickly as we can. We should be attainable housing units, units that will meet the needs of people at every different income level, starting from the shelter point and moving right through all the different levels in our workforce. We have to have a completely new way that we do economic development. We need to reformat the current Department of Economic Development and create a new, de new Department of Real Estate Vision and Planning. We are the biggest player in real estate and we do not know how to manage our real estate and that is where we derive most of our revenue from. And so once you get the housing going, the housing creates the jobs, the jobs create business opportunities, and the housing starts to handle the transit problem. That's my focus. That's what I think we should be doing right from the get-go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, Laura? 
Um, this, I let, this was, this is a great question. Um, I would like to read the following headlines in the newspaper someday. When the world was in the grips of a global pandemic, Portland, Maine did something extraordinary. They became the city that put science to work for its citizens. They changed the way they taught people to read and their city grew stronger. They worked together in neighborhoods and town halls to, desi to design a smart, efficient, accessible city with all of its citizens in mind and the city grew richer. They invested in public health, education and awareness and became the city with the highest life expectancy in the United States. They became so well known for the quality of life that they fueled smart, sustainable growth throughout the state of Maine. And now Maine has the highest measured happiness of any state in the union. The children in Maine are the happiest children in the world and most of them remain there for their entire lives. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you. Justin. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, I'll just warn you, there's, there's no way I'm gonna get through all five <laughs> major things in 75 seconds. But I'll, I'll try to uh, run through a few topics and, and just allude to some of the things. Um, I think uh, topic number one, of course, is gonna be housing. Uh, affordability of housing is critical to maintaining uh, so much of the fabric of our community and uh, expanding opportunities for people to live here affordably uh, has to be obviously one of uh, the very top goals that we've got. Um, the environment, um, you know, I, I think that obviously this is a pressing issue. We're a coastal city. We're uniquely vulnerable uh, to all sorts of impacts of global warming and climate change. Um, and we have a lot going on there. You know, we've uh, built our own solar land farm. We're uh, partnering with a lot of major uh, organizations throughout the state uh, and the power purchase agreement to build uh, and supply even more solar energy. Uh, we need to keep moving forward on that and the joint planning with South Portland. Um, addiction, economic uh, growth and uh, racial justice. I think we have to deal with all of uh, those issues in a holistic kind of way. Um, but uh, I'm not going to try to rattle off uh, specific uh, goals in five seconds on all of those things. <laughs> Understood. Okay, so just as a follow up, three of you, um, well, all four of you mentioned housing. Uh, uh, Laura Kelly uh, answered this question a little differently than the other three. But the, all of you mentioned housing is the first uh, priority and the first goal that needs to be addressed. Would any of you quantify in, in 10 years how much housing should be built in Portland? Um, Ron, you want to start? Sure. Um, no less than 5,000 um, housing units. Uh, we have so much available land along our transit corridor that we can easily add 5,000 citizens here without even making a dent. The issue is, and, and I said this just the other night, that we can build all the hotels we want. We have all the zoning and we have all the land, but we don't have the right land use policies to build housing for the people who are working in these hotels. And that is at the council level. And so we will not get anywhere until the log jam on this council is broken with new people who are really, truly pro-housing. Okay, uh, Justin, 45 seconds. Yeah, I, I would hesitate to give a specific number um, off the top of my head, but I think uh, you know somewhere in the vicinity of five to 10,000 new units uh, should be an aspiration uh, for us. Um, you know, in the, the long term, I mean, you alluded to this in the previous, uh, in one of the previous questions, uh, the dynamic that uh, we're facing in Portland, and it's not unique to Portland, uh, is that housing size, household sizes have been going down for decades. That's how it is that we can have more units than we used to have, but still feel that there's a housing crunch. And um, you know, that is a very complex issue, uh, especially when you have old housing stock like we do in Portland. So I think uh, I anticipate we're going to keep talking about this issue, but certainly adding to the housing stock is a major component of making it more affordable. Thank you very much. 
April? Um, this is a great question. So uh, it really doesn't matter how many we build if it's not affordable, um, definitely to Justin's point. And if we're talking about our population growth is about 500 per year in 10 years, that means 5,000 people. So I would think at least 2,500, if not 3,000 units of affordable housing need to be built in that 10 year time frame. Um, but the, the crux to all of it is it has to be affordable. So if people can't afford to have housing, it makes no sense to keep building luxury condos and things that are just going to be converted right into an Airbnb that doesn't that doesn't add to the housing stock that doesn't fix uh, the crunch that we're in. So I think anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 affordable units would be great. Thank you. And Laura? Um, so th this is the kind of question that, that, that I would say is would be purely speculative on my part, and it's really not the way, the way that I like to do things. Um, you know, we have someone on, on this uh, who has sort of deep industry knowledge, um, and, and, and so Ron gave, you know, an answer with, with, with a lot of experience and insight behind it. Um, the, and there are people who, who can help answer these kinds of questions. And what we need will, will depend on you know, the things that occur in the next few years. And, and I think sort of, sort of the degree that you can always be uh, making sure that you're, that you're doing things based on, you know, uh, based on evidence rather than speculation, uh, you'll, you'll have better outcomes. And I would just underscore trying to use buildings that are already here, um, as well as uh, as well as new things is you know, something to think about. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> We're now going to tran uh, transition to the six referendums uh, that are facing the city this election. Uh, Portland has six referendums on the ballot this year. Is the 1500 signature requirement too easy for citizens to put questions on a citywide ballot? Please explain. And Laura, I think you are up first. And this is 45 seconds. Uh, let's see. I, I guess that that's a, a conversation worth having, um, you know, with, with the, with how this has gone, um, you know, there there have been some different comments that I've heard about referendum. You know, this is something that people want, um, but 1,500 signatures out of um, the voters in uh, Portland is a really extremely low percentage, and I think that um, you know that, that that's actually a, a really a, a good question to answer that I'm not sure I have the great a great answer to, but you know how often does this happen, um, and and what's and and what what has come from it is something that should be considered. And then, do we want a higher bar that should be asked of of people? And that's a good question to ask people. Thank you, um, Councillor Costa. Um. So as a counselor, uh, I would not feel that it's appropriate uh, to change the formal requirements uh, for this, um, for how uh, ballot uh, initiatives qualify for the ballot. Um, but as a personal matter, yes, I feel that uh, the signature requirements uh, are one of several problems that we have uh, with the referendum process right now. And um, I, I know that we're gonna hear a lot about this reflects um, you know, a failure to listen and things of that nature. Uh, but I think what we're seeing this year um, really uh, uh, undermines that. You know, there are five questions that have been put forward by one organization, two of which have been voted down by the voters in the last five years, and a third which was largely adopted by the council. Um, and so I think there's a lot of frustration from people in the community that feel like they're being asked to vote on the same things repeatedly. Um, and I think that's uh, legitimate and something that we need to talk about. Thank you. April. Thanks. Um, no, I don't think it's um, too easy. Um, having gone out and collected signatures just for our own races, you know, we had to get at least 300 signatures for an at-large race accomplishing that in the middle of a pandemic is not an easy feat. Uh, and 
if you compare that to say someone who's running for the state legislature, they have to get 25 signatures. So for a ballot initiative to get 1500 signatures, not only for one, but in this case, there were five, that's over 11,000 signatures that had to be collected. Um, that requires dozens of volunteers, um, lots of people to be able to notarize it. So it's not just a, hey, I went and sat at the farmer's market and got 1500 signatures. It is, it does require a coordinated effort. So I think it's um, absolutely, I don't think it's too low. Thank you very much. Ron Gann. Well, after having, you know, a meltdown, wondering if I was even going to get my 500, um, I never really gave how many signatures the referendum people needed. But what has always concerned me is that we're like on our sixth referendum in X number of years. It's the issues, it's the issues that keep causing these referendums, and there's going to be more coming down the road. So I think that we really should ramp up the requirement for these referendums because it's starting to be used um, as blackmail. And all you have to do is just flip back to what happened with the working waterfront last year. They threatened a referendum and that brought us to our knees. So we need to have uh, many more signatures and a lot more uh, time uh, if, if people really want to change our policies. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next question, uh, the next six questions about are about the referendums. Uh, and they're just a quick yes or no answer. Uh, do you support question A, increasing the minimum wage? And uh, let's see, I think that we're, I think I've lost you or April, you're up first thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm up first, and yes, I support it. Ron? Yes, I support it. Laura? No. No. Justin? Uh, no. As the paper laid out today, it's poorly drafted, and the hazard pay provision is likely to take effect in a matter of weeks. Uh, and I say that as someone who literally sponsored Portland's minimum wage. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, I uh, you were just saying yes or no. We are, we're supposed to, we, we are supposed to say yes or no, yes. Um, do you support question B, added restrictions on facial surveillance? Ron? Um, I do not support adding more facial recognition. Laura? No. Justin? No. April? Question C, the Green New Deal. Laura? No. Justin? No. April? Yes. Ron? No. Question D, on rent control. Who are we at? We're at uh, Just, uh, Justin or, yeah? No. <laughs> no. Yes. Ron? No. No. All right. Okay. Question E, further restrictions on short-term rentals. April. Yes. Ron? No. Laura? No. And Justin? No. Question F, repealing limits on the number of marijuana retailers. Ron? Yes. Laura? Yes. Justin? No. April? Yes. Okay. Which referendum is most consequential for the city and why do you urge voters to support or oppose it? You have 60 seconds and Laura, you're up first. Uh, let's see. I, I haven't thought about them in terms of, of comparing them. Uh, I, I think I think they're 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 consequential, uh, all of them, and um, and 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 I have uh, I am 
not in favor of policy that has been written by unnamed individuals who were not elected, who are not accountable to what they did or to the policies um, that are, that where they haven't provided uh, the, the evidence to support uh, what they're doing because they haven't made the goals clear. And um, and so it's it's hard to tell without knowing what the goals are and why these policies would meet those goals, how do we measure success or failure and who's responsible? So uh, I, they're all consequential. And I, you know, I, I, I told you how I would vote. So that's how I feel. Thank you. Uh, Justin, Councilor Costa. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with much of what Laura just said. I, I think the most important thing for people to understand is that these are inflexible. And in the middle of a pandemic, I think it is highly irresponsible for us to lock ourselves into policy that can't be amended for five years. Um, you know, I'm particularly worried, I would say, about question C, because although it is, um, certainly well-intentioned, and there's much uh, that a lot of us would like to support. It makes changes uh, to environmental regulations, uh, some of which are not actually moving us forward. Um, it has dramatic impacts on affordable housing development and is opposed by the main affordable housing coalition, uh, again, because there's been no public vetting and a way to get at these things. Uh, before the language is finalized, and something that's near and dear to my heart, I think it severely jeopardizes our ability to complete our elementary school renovation. It's changing the requirements in the middle of a building and planning process. Uh, all of those kind of things uh, happen as a result of uh, a lack of process. Thank you very much. April. Um yeah, I think that's uh, a great question to narrow it down. I think, you know, similar to what's been said, you know, this is, it's a lot to consider for sure. And I just want to make sure that um, it's noted um, that yes, it says the, the ordinances can't be changed for five years, but it can be changed by the council. They can be changed by another referendum. Um, so once the new council's in, if something needs to be brought back to the table and discussed, it absolutely could be. I think, again, what we need to consider is why community members felt like they needed to go through a citizen's referendum versus working with our city leaders to accomplish this change. They felt unheard and enough, enough of them felt unheard to create these five questions. And so I think, um, as we've said, you know, the, the council and the mayor have let everyone know how they feel. The voters get a turn in a few weeks. Um, I, I think it's all Things that we need to focus on. I'm specifically focusing um, and really interested in the minimum wage increase. I think that is critical. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Councilor Costa, you were just shaking your head uh, when April Fournier was saying that these can be amended either by referendum or by city council. Could you explain why you were shaking your head for 30, very briefly, 30 seconds? Yeah. I think that uh, this is a very important point, and I, I think it was a little bit unclear there. The council cannot change anything for five years. It has to go through another referendum. That is a fairly lengthy process to schedule an election. So the Press Herald noted, for example, this morning that the minimum wage, as written in this proposal, will go to $18 an hour in a matter of weeks. I hope that doesn't crush the restaurant industry in the middle of a pandemic, but if it does, nothing is gonna be able to be modified until months down the road. So I think it's very important. You can disagree with everything that I just said about the substance of it, but people need to be aware that the council can't modify anything, even a drafting error. Thank you. Uh, April, do you have anything to add to that? Or do you agree with that? Um, I, you know, I think definitely what, what Justin said, you know, the, can't, the council can't modify. It. He's right. It does have to go back to referendum. Um, but I think what is misleading is saying that we can't change this. We're locked into this fight for five years is misleading. It can be changed. Through the same process. Okay. Thank you very much. Ron, back to the original question. Um, which referendum is most consequential for the city? 
you know, I, I, I want to kind of jump in, though, on, on this conversation, though, with, with Justin and April for a minute, because it's kind of interesting. We just got done talking about adding, potentially adding more signatures to make a referendum. And now we're saying is that, well, if you don't really like this, you can just have another referendum. Well, we can't keep on having referendums. And there's a, a, a quirkiness to the way this thing was written. I'm in favor of the minimum wage part. It, it's a moral thing for me. And I believe that everyone needs to make more money and we should just all pay more for, for stuff. But you can't ask for more money for wages and also over on this other side, by the way, we're gonna make it cost more money to build your house. It, does, it doesn't compute. And I get how they got all these signatures. It's easy when you present it in a certain way, but these referendums are gonna have a lot of devastating effects that the people who put this out have not contemplated. And if, on day one, if this thing passes, what I'd like to ask April is, what do you see happening? What will be happening here in Portland on day one if these things pass? Well, that's, um, I think let's go to the next question because it's going to address some of this. So let's go there and see how that uh, develops. It the seems that a that certain- I, Go ahead. I was just gonna say the fact that I actually agreed with Justin on something, we should mark the date and time on that. <laughs> okay. It seems that a certain level of frustration, at least with certain constituents, has led to this surge in referendums. Should the council have been more aggressive in responding to these issues? Going forward, what, if anything, should be done differently? Councilor Costa, you're up first. And this is 90 seconds. Sure. Um, well, look, I think first and foremost, uh, we have to emphasize that everyone always has a right to be heard. You have a right to express your opinion and you have the right to have views that are diametrically opposed to any elected official at any level, certainly including the city council. Um, I think, you know, there is a lot of um, sort of the campaign rhetoric that we're hearing around these is around this idea that uh, it's the city council that isn't listening to people. And I think it's, again, uh, I made the point earlier, it's very important to point out the simple fact that two of these issues have been voted down by the people by sizable margins in the last few years. So it's not that the council isn't addressing it, but rent control was on the ballot in 2017 and it failed by uh, more than 20 points. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, we do have to acknowledge that that is a part of the dynamic, that this is, uh, as the voters have shown, uh, not a majority point of view. And there's no presumption that something that isn't a majority point of view should become the law of the land. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, again, uh, everyone has a right to be heard, but no one has a right uh, to win at any given time in a democracy. And I, I think we just need to stay grounded in that. And uh, the repeated calling of the same question is really damaging uh, and it's unfortunate. Thank you very much. April. <clears throat> yeah. Um... I think one thing that Justin just said is really interesting. No one has the right to win. And I, I definitely agree with that. And so mm -hmm. if, if something to me, and just this is the way that my brain works, you know, as an educator working through data and trying to make sense of behaviors that are repeated, a behavior is a form of communication. It's a symptom of something deeper. So if I see something coming up, that's coming up over and over and over again, to me, it means that whatever the underlying cause is, whatever the function of the behavior that's happening, that's not being addressed. And so I think um, the, the tricky part about um, these coming up over and over again, um, I, I don't want to govern by referendum. I think that's a terrible way to govern. Um, but right now, it's something that we absolutely have to deal with, that our citizens and enough of them didn't feel heard so that they created these questions. So I think, again, we need to ask, how can we be better communicators as 
city leaders so that we are hearing them. And yes, you can certainly come to a council meeting and be heard um, if you can make the time to get to a committee meeting where some of the decisions are made, you can certainly be heard there. But to me, we have all these questions that came up that just make it seem like we weren't really being heard um, or people weren't getting their needs met. And that's why these questions happened. Thank you very much. Ron? Let's drill down a little bit deeper on what um, April is saying. What are the underlying conditions here? Let's think about this for a minute, that the people who are promoting the historic district on Munjoy Hill are no different in how they're feeling than the people who are in favor of these five referendums. It is their anger and their helplessness. And you, you know, Justin can say that the council hears everybody, but clearly <coughs> there is a dip glitch somewhere in this process and that people are girded. They're even more girded now for these referendums. And, you know, a lot of people don't know, but there's a 26 page addendum to the land use code that's just sitting on the desk from the people in, up on Munjoy Hill and in the West End that they're promoting to shut down all development on the peninsula. So if they don't get their way, they'll do a referendum. And the next time that somebody on the waterfront loses their birth, they're going to do a referendum. And that's what we're that's how we are governing. We govern by fear. We're so fearful of change that all we do is kick the can down the road and we wait for something to erupt and then we deal with it. And now we've got these five or six referendums that we're dealing with. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura Kelly. <clears throat> so, I, th I think it's, I think it's really important um, always to remember um, that, uh, um, that people who are listening to people who think just like they do, sometimes fail to see a bigger picture. And it, it's why it's why it's very important to always sort of go back and look at at, at the data. I, I find the fact that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and we are talking about this the, the, these referenda have dominated our conversations um, to perhaps not be reflective of the kinds of things that are on the minds of the majority of people. Now, I, I want to solve wealth inequality. I don't think that the, the $15 uh, wage increase with the emergency multiplier is the way to do that. And in talking to lots of people, that might be a, a, a way to cripple small businesses. Um, we also have a wage uh, main past a, a, a statewide um, minimum wage legislation that will probably get us there in, in two years. And so, you know, while our democratic institutions are slow, they're important to the degree that we can, that, that, that elected people create the policy, they're accountable to it, um, and, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. We're on to our fourth segment, which is Portland's charter. Should Portland have a strong elected mayor with executive powers currently reserved for the city manager, which includes drafting a budget and hiring, firing city staff? Or do you support having a professional manager who is overseen by the council or something entirely different? April, you are first and you'll have 60 seconds. Very interesting question. Um, so I think, at least from the outside and from what we have observed, um, when you have a mayor, like our previous mayor, who has a strong personality and has some ideas of things that he wants to do, that clashed very much with the city manager's equally strong personality and beliefs for things that he wanted to do. Um, I think if we're going to have someone who 
um, like the mayor having executive powers and being able to um, make those decisions. I think, again, you're going to have to extricate some of the responsibilities from each side because it just, when there isn't a clear communication of who is responsible for what, it just creates um, it creates confusion. And I think when you create confusion, that's when you start to create that conflict. Um, one of the things that I think is frustrating right now is there are opportunities where the city manager's office does override some of the committee work. Um, and that makes you wonder why do you have the committees in the first place? Well, that's interesting. You brought up that there was the clash uh, and that there was not, um, that there was confusion about the role uh, but is that true? Is, isn't the charter pretty, I mean, it's understood. Uh, it was that the mayor didn't like the charter, which, and, and, and which is a valid point, I, I would say, but isn't that really the case? It's not that there was uncertainty about who had what role. 30 seconds to respond, April. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't know enough about um, that mayor's understanding of the charter. Uh, we never really had a discussion about that. Um, I do know from someone who wasn't deeply involved in the politics, but really just someone who is a citizen of Portland seeing what's happening, it was a very public back and forth, often butting heads. And so I, I didn't really know who was responsible for what. It was just, there was a lot of dysfunction and whether that was an understanding of role or personality, I don't really know, but I know as a citizen, that was incredibly frustrating to watch. Thank you very much. Uh, Ron? Well, I was thinking about this the other day, and um, you know, I think that uh, John Jennings has taken a lot of unfair hits because m most of the issues that we have, he inherited these issues. And I think that anybody who had a strong personality like him who came in at this situation seeing that the council has basically abdicated he would he or she would take over and do the things that they're doing too so we have to have a hybrid situation number one the council has to be more demanding on the city manager and his or her roles with staff below. There is no accountability. You have departments where people are operating as if they're little fiefdom. The mayor is supposed to be in charge of vision and the mayor needs to have a staff so that she or he can exercise that vision. Thank you I very much. There's more to it, but you only gave me 90 seconds, I guess. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Again, this, this question has gone to voters um, not not that long ago, and they essentially kept it kept it the way it is now, and and so I think that you know April articulates something that I hear from people a lot, which is a lack of clarity just in general, and you know there have there have been decisions made that have that have caused hurt and anger in the electorate that have that for which John Jennings has been the spokesperson. Um, and, and he's making decisions that are budgetary, but perhaps not thinking about the lives that are impacted, but, but that's not reflective of, of, of any, of, of a dysfunction in the role. Um, maybe it's a reflective of a, a lack of understanding about what impacts a community's health and well-being. So maybe, you know, maybe we could be more sensitive to that and, and do a better job. But, it, but I, um, Thank you know, you. I think Thank people you. are going to feel differently than they felt repeatedly. Uh, Justin. Um, so... First and foremost, I think it's always important to emphasize that uh, it's the responsibility of counselors to operate within the bounds of the charter. And ultimately, that's going to be up to the people. Um, you know, so we're, we need to accept uh, however those roles are defined, uh, whatever positions we happen to be elected to. Um, 
I would not support a strong executive mayor. I think um, that is the type of thing that can potentially be dangerous, honestly, in the state of Maine. Um, we, in Maine, we don't really do that anywhere else. Um, there are a very, very limited number of uh, positions in Maine that are true executives. Um, and that are elected. And what that means is uh, it's a different skill set and uh, setting policy and uh, doing things like that is a very different skill set uh, than the skill set that you need to uh, interview people, hire a chief of police or a fire department or an airport director. Um, and I don't think those things uh, need to be taken out of the hands of a professional manager. Thank you. For the next question, would you support expanding the city council to include an equal amount of district and at large councilors to balance specific district interests versus citywide interests and perhaps drive longer term thinking in policy formulation? And I believe, uh, are we with Laura on this one to start? And it is 60 seconds. So good question, good idea. Um, you know, I think one of the things that <clears throat> has become really apparent to me is that the job of, of the city councilor is a big job and it's a really important job. And people are, people are doing this alongside um, full-time jobs. That limits the kinds of voices that could come to the table. And when we know uh, for certain that uh, diverse groups of people bring more innovative and more creative solutions to the table um, than, than bodies where everybody is um, from sort of this, the same mindset. Um, it, it would be great to, to find ways to sort of increase the capacity of the council. Um, and so adding more people seems like that seems like a, a good solution so thank you very much uh councilor costa um yeah that's an interesting one uh i guess ultimately that'll be up for the charter commission uh to <laughs> to discuss but um it's not something i've ever given much thought to uh, my first reaction is to say um a group of nine is a pretty good uh, number to uh, to balance uh, the need to have a variety of uh, voices uh, with being able to also um, have personal relationships with all of your colleagues. And I think that that is sort of a key uh, feature of how municipal government runs uh, at both levels, on the council and on the school board. Um, but yes, I, I would have to uh, give it more serious thought to, be able to uh, give you a firmer answer. Thank you. April. Thanks. Um, similar to Justin, I have not ever thought <laughs> about that question, so it's a really good one. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, when you think of nine people trying to make decisions together and just the communications that go along with that, that's that's a, that's a pretty good sized group. And so expanding beyond that, I think would be challenging, but I also agree that, you know, more voices and more diverse voices is so important. So, you know, I think it's definitely something the Charter Commission could look at, but I think another thing we could ask ourselves is when we're looking at the body of counselors that we have and the, the voices that are being represented and the ability to one, run for office and have the finances to do that, but also spend the amount of time that you need to spend um, as a counselor, it is, you know, a part-time, almost more than part-time job. Um, how do we make this office more accessible so that we are getting more people um, into the room so that those nine voices are truly representative of the people who live in Portland? Thank you very much. Ron Gann? Well, at first blush, I guess like everybody, I never gave it any thought, but I think nine is okay. I think that getting a consensus from nine people is, is difficult enough. What I think would be interesting though, um, I was on the food truck task force. And I think that more of that as a way of interfacing with the council might be a better way to do it than adding more counselors to it. 
I don't need all my time for this one. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I am going to skip ahead to land use policy. Uh, we're uh, we've got about 30 minutes left, and because uh, of the other questions, there's obviously um, a lot of uh, concern about housing and other land use issues. Portland has a shortage of housing in every economic segment, whether it is for subsidized low income housing, missing middle and even higher end homes. There is unprecedented demand for each. What is the obstacle to building more housing and accelerating getting it built? Uh, Councillor Costa, I believe you are first and it is 90 seconds. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, the development of housing, I, I think, is obviously the biggest concern, and it's one of the most complicated uh, areas. Um, at a high level, I would say this to, to sort of illustrate the complication with it. Um, if you met someone and were told that uh, they just moved into a new house that had been built for them, uh, I think most people would make certain assumptions if you were asked to guess what that person's income likely was. You would not suggest, oh, that's probably someone that makes less than the average person if they're living in a brand new house. Um, the reason I bring that up is the fundamental issues that we are facing are driven by one, as I alluded to earlier, the decline in household size over time. The other thing is that uh, real affordability of housing is always tied to, <clears throat> excuse me, to depreciation. What we really needed, which could be a big help right now, was we needed a lot of housing built 20 years ago. And if we had had that, and that housing was already on the market, then there would be a lot more housing that was more affordable to more people at all income levels. What we as Americans do is we are reliant on subsidizing the construction of new housing and uh, to try and provide affordability. And if you can't provide subsidy, then you also don't have affordability. That's uh, the nut that we're trying to crack. That's what the Housing Trust Fund is about um, and a whole variety of things, but uh, I think we'll come back. Thank you very much for that answer. April. <laughs> Uh, great question. Um, you know, I think when we're looking at the recode and we're looking at zoning, um, you know, we have space that is available to build on, but we need to make sure that as we are doing the recode, we're looking at, you know, mixed use development and making space that's able to be used um, for uh, residential or um, multi unit housing. Um, I think, of course, making it affordable is key. So we could build all the housing we want, but if it's all out of the reach of people who are going to live here, um, it doesn't it doesn't matter how much housing we build, it's going to be empty. Um, so I think looking at the area median income and making sure that it reflects the people who actually live here is critical because we can build all we want, but if people can't afford it, it doesn't make any sense to build it. Um, and then I think as we're looking at um, the neighborhood that we're looking to build in, um, making sure that what we are building also isn't going to significantly impact the character of the neighborhood. So if we're going to build things along transit corridors, we want to also make sure that it does keep the integrity and the character of the neighborhood. So, um, yeah, it's. I think we definitely need more. I just, I think we need to make sure that um, we're doing it in a smart way. Thank you very much. Just to follow up, you mentioned the area media median income, and to to go back to what Councillor Costa just uh, spoke about. If we are to subsidize more housing, that money has to come from somewhere. So to lower the AMI, that means bigger subsidies. All of that mostly is driven by federal dollars, which are set by on a per capita basis. So then where would we get that funding if we were to attempt to do that? And, and of course, a lot of the AMI is driven by federal government. Sure, I think that's a great question. Um, so one of the things I actually looked at today, just because I was curious, um, is one of my um, friends had posted online just you know how they struggle uh, and how they are at 100% of AMI. And so I was curious for, for me, for a family of six, what does that mean? Um, and then looking it up, you know, the, I think the AMI for a family of six 
here in Portland is 114 or 116,000. Um, I am not even close to that. And that's shocking to me. And I'm a homeowner and I've been a homeowner um, here in East Deering since 2006. Um, I've been, I would have to look into where the funding would come from. I'm not sure, but to me, it was shocking that the jobs that we have and the, the money that we have coming into our home, um, we're still only at 78% of what is expected for affordable uh, in this area. So um, I definitely would have to look more into that on where the funding would come from. But I think looking at what we use for those measures is an important piece. Thank you very much. Uh, Ron Gann? Well, first off, I do not believe this is a complex problem. It's a simplistic problem. Our land use policies, which are put out by the city council, do not allow us to build in the areas where we have the least expensive land. Now, that is a fact. There's no, you, can't, you can't argue with that. And the average income in Portland is 30,000. So who cares what the average median is? That's what the people who are working in the restaurants make. Now we have a lot of land and we can build a lot of interesting attainable housing if we have the right land use policy. Look around at the other cities at what they're doing. Rock Row in Westbrook, Brunswick Landing, the Bitterford Mill, the new vertical growing system with housing on top of it, that's in Westbrook. We have none of that because we don't have the zoning to allow for that. And the reason we don't have the zoning is because we are locked down in fear of change here. And so we can build all kinds of housing to meet the needs of our workforce, all kinds. The city has been an impediment to this process. It's time for the city to be a major player we have really, really good land that they will not unlock. We can build hundreds of these small little workforce cottages very easily, and we can create subsidies so that people can afford to live here in Portland. It's not, com it's not a complex issue. It's just that we don't have the will yet. Thank you, Ron. Laura. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I hear... Um... I, I hear the things that, that Ron says from, from people who, who want to build, that it's too hard, um, that it's too hard to build, that, that it all comes down to zoning and, the, and that this is very important. And so, um, you know, I, again, I, I seek expert opinions and things. And so you know, when I hear that that's the key to, to solving some of these problems, uh, some of the need for housing and stuff, um, I believe that the the zoning it is is the way to solve that problem, and and I would only sort of underscore that I think one of the things that that seems like it, it doesn't get done well often and everywhere is making sure that you're building to meet um, variable needs. Um, you know, often cities will invest in things like something like you know, invest multi-million dollars to build a large facility that doesn't actually meet the needs of the people. Um, and so, you know, housing is no different. Um, the, the hotel workers and restaurant workers that, that Ron refers to um, are, are part of that need, um, but, but also uh, families and, and, um, and thinking about not everybody wants to be in a, a stacked building, um, you know, Families want to be able to look outside and watch their kids play. So doing a good needs assessment, making sure that, you know, that we're enabling people to come to the table, to solve this, the housing need is, is really important and um, seems like it's a solvable. Thank you, Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, this is the last question before we go into your closing statements. So please uh, keep the time uh, constraints. Under what, if any, circumstances should real estate developers be given tax breaks for property or housing development? Uh, 30 seconds, and April, you are up first. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think when I, when I think about tax breaks for developers, I really, it, for me, it comes back to the labor that they're using. So making sure that the people that they're hiring are 
um, union members that are being paid prevailing wage for what um, what they work, uh, as well as um, making sure that what they are building is giving back to the community. And so making sure that they're allocating enough for workforce housing um, and that they're um, building responsibly and sustainably. Thank you. Uh, Ron? What was the question again? Under what, if any, circumstances should real estate developers be given tax breaks for property or housing development? So are we speaking of a TIF or are we speaking of some other kind of? Tax? It could be anything, whether it's grants, TIFs, low well, income housing tax credits, any of that. All right. So I need my 45 seconds because I think this is an important thing. And, and April, this is for you because I've heard this from so many people. You guys continually talk about developers as if we are bad people. If there's no developers, there will be no housing. Someone has to build it. It's the model of development that is important. And so if you run through, and if your group had actually sat down with either landlords or developers, you might know how much it actually costs to do something. And then you can see what kind of subsidies, because we will not be able to build affordable housing for anybody without some kind of subsidy, whether it's tax or a, you know, less on fees. But also the other part of it is, is that we should be giving incentives to developers. We should be giving them reasons to build the affordable housing and be willing to make a little less money. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ron. Laura? Um, so uh, I, I like to think uh, about everything in terms of what uh, lends to a greater health and well-being of our community. So, you know, incentives that helped us reach climate goals that, that um, or incentives that help us, um, you know, meet needs of, of specific populations that are vulnerable populations. I think we can think of a lot of ways to um, to support um, people coming to the table to meet the needs of the community um, that serve dual purposes. That's like a perfect kind of solution. Thank you very much. Councillor Costa. Um, yeah, thanks, Tim. So uh, I guess I just want to emphasize um, that, you know, what, what I heard you asking about was tax breaks. So I certainly heard uh, TIF uh, to, to Ron's point uh, being in that, which is tax increment financing. It's actually a, a subset of that called credit enhancement agreements. Um, you know, now I think the important point uh, for for people to sort of take away from this is everything that uh, April talked about, that's the current policy. Uh, that's something that we've already implemented. We implemented several years ago, um, and I certainly support it. Um, we basically only give uh, tax breaks to developers right now if they're developing affordable housing. Uh, that's uh, There's an annual report that you can access online. There's all sorts of detail uh, around that, but that's what we do. Thank you very much. We are now going to uh, transition to uh, the closing statements. You each get two minutes. And Councillor Costa, you are up first. We did this in alphabetical order. OK. Um, well, uh, again, thanks, Tim, uh, for all the work uh, to pull this together. We've had to move it around. And I, I know that a lot of people have been involved in organizing all of this. And uh, it doesn't happen easily. Um, this is, uh, I would say, uh, as I've been saying throughout, an incredibly important time for the city of Portland. Uh, the pandemic that we're facing, the accompanying recession, uh, the fact that the federal government support uh, appears uh, to be gone and perhaps not uh, coming again, uh, means that this is the most difficult and serious time that the city has faced uh, in generations uh, and maybe ever. Um, this is the most important time uh, for us to be able to address all of the myriad issues that we have been talking about uh, tonight. Uh, I think our discussion tonight has laid bare that, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, we agree on the direction that we want to go. And the question uh, for all of us is, who is going to be best positioned as a counselor 
uh, to make progress on all of those issues. And I think our discussion has shown how complex and interrelated all of these issues are. And if we wanna make progress right now, and if we wanna have someone that can address these issues uh, immediately, given the crisis that we are facing, uh, that's what I bring to the table as a, a sitting counselor, as a former school board member, as someone who is versed in how all of this works. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important right now for the city. Great, thank you very much. April Fournier. Thank you. I'm just going to take two seconds before my two minutes just to circle back to something that Ron had mentioned. He mentioned my group talking as if the People First Portland and all the referenda were a group that I'm involved in, um, and that's not accurate. So it is not my group. I did not um, write any of the referenda. I didn't have anything to do with organizing them. I just support them. So I just want to make sure that that's really clear. Um, and now I'll start my closing statement. Um, so I'm really just grateful to have this opportunity um, to be able to share this. Thank you so much for putting it together. It is a lot of work. Um, you know, running for office is a privilege and being able to have this platform um, and talk to people is just an, an incredibly um, special privilege that I'm grateful for. Um, I think that my lived experience, my work experience, my educational opportunities have really grown and developed the skills that I need to be great at when we engage our community as a counselor. Um, I have lots of experience working with lots of different uh, parties, bringing people to the table together, making sure that as I'm developing, um, whether it's plans or educational policies um, or whatever the case is, um, I am making sure that everyone at the table um, has a voice and that I'm hearing those voices and the decisions I'm making are based on the data that we collect there. I think a critical component for success in this office is that you do have to be a really great communicator. You have to be an inclusive leader and you need to be a collaborative partner. I know I can do all of these things well. Um, the last thing is just please remember to get out and vote. Uh, everyone that's watching this, make a plan to vote, make your friends vote, get your family to vote. Um, it's just so critical that we really truly hear everybody's voices uh, this coming election. So thank you so much for this opportunity and time. Thank you very much. Ron Gann. So <clears throat> we are at the nexus of the pandemic, a housing crisis, higher taxes, a social justice issue. And we have to have a variety of new skill sets on the city council. So I bring to this situation my experience in the world of real estate and development. And the city of Portland is, in fact, the largest player in real estate, and we have not managed our real estate well. Even if we were to have built housing 20 years ago, there's still a lot of gaps in the way we manage our real estate. And so we have to start looking at, in, at things with a different lens, a much more creative lens, and we have to start dispelling these old narratives. We're, we're held down by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, by ideas that are 30 and 40 years old. If we want to progress, we need to generate revenue and we need to generate new sources of revenue. We can't keep slicing the old pie. We have to put a face out to the world. We have to bring more businesses here with higher paying jobs and we have to create the kind of housing so that every single person in this city is, has shelter. There is absolutely no reason why we cannot be the most prosperous city on the East Coast and do something that nobody else has ever done, and that is to eliminate our homeless problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Laura Kelly? Thank you. <clears throat> what do we do in times of great hardship? How do we move forward? An American president once said that there are no problems we cannot solve together and very few that we can solve by ourselves. He thought it would take 50 years for every child to find knowledge to enrich his mind and enlarge his talents. He told us that liberty for all meant an end to poverty and racial injustice. He said it would take 50 years for us to be more concerned with the quality of our goals and the quantity of our goods. 
It's been 55 years and we haven't succeeded, but we have learned what we need to do to succeed. I was taught that our most essential task is to do better for those who come after us. I don't forget that I am one generation removed from a desperate childhood, that my life was built upon sacrifices of others who worked their entire lives, served our country during three wars over the course of an entire century, and who endured untold hardship for the chance of a better life in the future. In my personal and professional life, I have witnessed too often how circumstances far removed from an individual's control and certainly beyond the control of any child become the determinants of an entire life, sometimes for generations. I'm not a traditional politician. I'm running for office in the middle of a global pandemic during the most heated election cycle in modern history at a time when the electorate is so divided that the cracks in our foundation have become chasms that threaten our ability to withstand. These are the circumstances that set the stage for me to stick my neck out to say that it's time for us to do the work we haven't done, to build a stronger foundation for children, their families, and our communities because we know how and we're capable and because they deserve that from us. Thank you very much to all the candidates for your time. I hope that this debate was very useful to all the viewers uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to the election and to everyone getting out and voting. Thank you very much.